Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and this is birthday girl Cindy Oliver and she's a dog. A number of people have asked me to make a video about Dr. John Campbell's recent video entitled Vitamin D Now Conclusive. So I'm going to do that. But before I do it, I just wanted to make one thing clear. Vitamin D is an essential vitamin that is necessary for optimal immune function as well as other things. And if you're deficient in it, which a lot of people are, you should be taking a supplement. However, it won't give you superpowers and you can get too much of a good thing. And if you'd like more details on why you don't want to take too much vitamin D, I cover it in this video here which I made just over a year ago with my beautiful dog, Julie. But John's latest video has been triggered by a new vitamin D meta-analysis, which you can see here. It's called Protective Effects of Vitamin D Supplementation on COVID-19 Related Intensive Care Hospitalization and Mortality. Definitive Evidence for Meta-Analysis and Trial Sequential Analysis. Bit of a mouthful. And it's published in one of the many MDPI journals, which is always a sign that you need to be cautious about the paper's conclusions. Not all papers published in MDPI journals are bad, but they do publish a lot of rubbish. Anyway, let's now take a look at what John says about it. We now know that vitamin D supplementation provides substantial benefit in terms of reducing the risk of admission to intensive care during the coronavirus pandemic. 72% is the probable figure, certainly substantial. And it probably also gives us a 51% protection against death, vitamin D supplementation. Now on this channel, we've been talking about vitamin D since we started the channel in 2007, a long time ago now, and we've been talking about it throughout the COVID pandemic period of time. Now we have this new meta-analysis from Italy, definite protection against admission to intensive care for patients that are ill or hospitalised. So straight out of the gates, and John is already misrepresenting the paper. The meta-analysis is not looking at people who are ill or hospitalised. It is only looking at people who are hospitalised, as you can see from this table here. However, the paper does make the claim that they show vitamin D provides definitive protection against ICU admission. It is a claim, however, that is not supported by the data presented in the paper. This is apparent just by reading the paper, but it becomes even more apparent if you dig a little deeper and check out their data sources. But first, let's look at how we tell just by reading the paper. The authors perform what is known as a risk of bias assessment for all the studies they included. And you can see the results in this chart. Green means low risk of bias, red means high risk of bias, and yellow means some concerns. As you can see, there is only one study that overall has a low risk of bias. And it just so happens that this study didn't show a benefit for vitamin D. If only one study in your analysis has a low risk of bias and the study's findings contradict the results of your analysis, you can't say your results are definitive. To have a high degree of certainty in the results of a meta-analysis, it needs to be based on studies with a low risk of bias. But hang on, didn't they do some other fancy analysis that proved it was definitive? Anyway, this is the paper here. All available, download it for yourself, PDFs available. Definitive evidence and meta-analysis and trial sequential analysis. Now this trial sequential analysis is sort of an add-on to meta-analysis. And it allows us to uh, account for the uh, degrees of uncertainty in the data and to make predictions based on that. So it's really quite clever. Uh, thankfully, it's all done by, by computer. Uh, there's programs to do it. Well, as we all know, the problem with using computers is the 
guy go principle. Garbage in, garbage out. This paper here was referenced by the authors of the study in their explanation of trial sequential analysis. Does this paper support their claim that using trial sequential analysis allowed them to be definitive about their finding regarding ICU admissions following vitamin D administration? In a word, no. This text comes from the paper and I'll just read it out to you. If uh, TSA with such an approach shows a statistical significant intervention effect judged by the TSA adjusted confidence interval, there is a very high probability that the intervention has an effect provided that the included trials are at a low risk of bias. But of course, the trials here don't have a low risk of bias, so performing a trial sequential analysis is pointless. So that's what can be picked up just by reading the paper. But as I said, if you do a little digging, you can find more issues. I showed this table earlier. It's a summary of the studies that they included in the meta-analysis. And as you can see, it says they are all randomised controlled trials, which is good because you should only combine randomised controlled trials with other randomised controlled trials in a meta-analysis. Only problem is the information shown in the table is false. So this is the paper that they identify as NOGS 2021. If you look at the methods, you will see that they describe it as an observational cohort study. In other words, it's not a randomised control study and never should have been included in the meta-analysis. But it was. And if you look at the mortality forest plot here, you can see that it accounts for 86% of the results. So what happens if we remove it from the forest plot and just include the studies that actually were randomised controlled trials? Let's have a look. I have made this forest plot with a different software package than was used in the NDPI paper, which is why it looks a bit different in format. However, the key thing that is different is that the diamond is no longer to the left of the vertical line. It crosses it, meaning that the new meta-analysis does not show a mortality benefit for vitamin D. So that's mortality. The other main claim in the paper is that vitamin D leads to a reduction in ICU admissions. So let's have a look at that now. This is the forest plot for ICU admissions from the original MDPI paper. In this case, the NOGS paper is weighted 66% in the results. Again, let's look at what happens when we remove it. As with the mortality forest plot, the diamond is now crossing the vertical line, meaning we can no longer say that vitamin D is beneficial for keeping people out of the ICU. It is also worth noting that the I squared value, which is a measure of heterogeneity, is 71%, which shows that the studies are inconsistent in their findings. So basically they included a study that they shouldn't have and when it is removed there is no longer a benefit for vitamin D. Interestingly, I also found a couple of studies that they didn't include. According to the authors, studies were included if they met the following criteria. Involving participants with no gender or ethnicity restrictions who were tested for SARS-CoV-2 and who were aged 18 years or older and investigating any type of vitamin D supplementation in comparison with placebo, the standard of care or no treatment. They excluded all other kinds of studies, studies that administered additional agents or agents other than vitamin D, studies that did not test for SARS-CoV-2 infection and studies with missing assessments of mortality and ICU admission. 
and they did a search on the 20th of September 2022. So obviously they would only pick up studies published before then. This study here meets the criteria. It's a randomised open-label clinical trial in patients over 18 with moderate to severe COVID-19 disease, requiring hospitalisation, comparing a bolus of vitamin D with no treatment, which measured both mortality and ICU admission and was published in February 2022. But for some strange reason, it wasn't included. And if you're curious as to what the study found, no significant difference in ICU admissions was seen between the vitamin D group and the placebo group, and no significant difference was seen in mortality between the vitamin D group and the placebo group. Although they did find that low serum levels of vitamin D at admission was associated with poorer outcomes. There is also this study here, which was published on the 27th of May, 2022. They enrolled adults and it was a randomised trial that compared high-dose vitamin D with placebo. It tested for SARS-CoV-2 infection and included assessments for mortality and ICU admission. But again, it wasn't included. Anyway, in case you're curious, these were their results. No significant difference in ICU admissions or mortality was seen between the vitamin D group and the placebo group. So we have two studies that appear to meet the criteria for inclusion but weren't included, and neither of them showed a benefit for vitamin D. It's very curious, and there's possibly more I haven't done a thorough search. Anyway, that's enough about that paper. John also discusses another meta-analysis in his video. This is another study here, a COVID-19 and vitamin D systematic review, another, another systematic review. The rates of uh, positivity in the tests were significantly decreased in the intervention group as opposed to the non-intervention uh, group. So the, uh, the PCR tests were less likely to be positive. So vitamin D is actually protecting against infection here. Uh, relative risk uh, 0.46, so that's what a 54% protection against infection in the first place. Better than other treatments which are currently being recommended. Why is this not being shouted from the rooftops by our regulatory authorities, who I believe now are acting unethically in not uh, giving this advice? Uh, conclusively, this paper says, direct quote, that COVID-19 uh, patients supplemented with the vitamin D, fewer rates of ICU admissions, less mortality, and uh, less positivity. So this is the other meta-analysis that John is talking about. It's called COVID-19 and vitamin D, co-vivid study. A systematic review and meta-analysis of randomised controlled trials. Should we have a quick look and see what the conclusion says? In conclusion, vitamin D use was associated with significant decrease in rates of COVID-19 related events when all the outcomes were pulled across all RCTs. However, there was no significant difference observed for the relative risk of ICU admission and mortality outcomes upon vitamin D supplementation. The overall pooled results, in addition to a significant decrease in the rates of RT-PCR positivity observed in this study, are suggestive of the possible beneficial effects of vitamin D. These inconclusive results would indicate the need for more RCTs in support of the beneficial effect of vitamin D in COVID-19. Furthermore, it is reasonable to speculate that vitamin D deficiency could be a proxy of other conditions as advanced age, BMI, diabetes, liver disease, etc., all known to negatively impact on the outcomes of COVID-19. Despite a randomization done in the included trials, these conditions may act as 
co-founders. And hence the potential benefits of vitamin D in COVID-19 has to be interpreted with caution and needs to be investigated further in large-scale studies. Rather different to what John Klein, the study, found. Sorry, a bit over-emotional today. I do try and keep it cognitive, but uh, it just gets to you from time to time. Things that we could, should be doing, but we don't bother. But there again, vitamin D is cheap, so why the heck should we? I've said enough. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you so much for watching. John seems to be using a nudge, nudge, wink, wink technique to suggest that vitamin D isn't being promoted because there is no money in it. In fact, there is a lot of money in it. The worldwide market for vitamin D is estimated to be worth $1.47 billion, and that's American dollars. It's also worth mentioning that the MDPI study was funded by a supplement company. They would hardly be funding studies if selling supplements wasn't profitable. The same as pharmaceutical companies wouldn't be funding clinical trials if selling medications wasn't profitable. And finally, the suggestion that vitamin D isn't recommended is also false. This is from the NHS guidelines on vitamin D, which clearly state that everyone should be supplementing with vitamin D in the winter months. And those at greater risk should be supplementing all year round. Now, I'm not gonna get emotional. I will just say that as usual, John is misrepresenting data and failing to critically assess studies. Vitamin D is an essential vitamin and you should be taking a supplement if you are deficient, but it won't give you superpowers and too much could be harmful. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of this video that I have made another video that provides more details on vitamin D. There should be a link to that video coming up soon, either up there or up there. I should really work out which, which one it is and just point to the right place, but oh, I keep forgetting until I get ready to record. Also, if you'd like to look further into the data I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember this video is about science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. If you've got this far, thank you for listening. And if you've liked or commented on the video, double thank you because that helps the algorithm and means that more people will see the video. And of course, thank you to everyone who has bought me a coffee. I really appreciate your support. I will be continuing to make videos about the science in the future. So if you'd like to see them, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.